Hello, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a, a great lunch, and welcome to those of you who are just joining. Uh, my name is Angela Hansen. I am with the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD, and along with colleagues that you have heard from as a part of this boot camp uh, earlier today, I'm also working on mission-oriented innovation. We had a really interesting uh, food for thought from the discussion groups that some of you were uh, just a part of. And uh, I'll share some of the reflections from those groups uh, because we were chatting a bit about it uh, over lunch and it sounds like the discussions were quite interesting and will be good input for the panel discussion today. Um, so as my colleagues mentioned earlier, this adoption of a mission-oriented more mission-oriented approach uh, is really important uh, in terms of the implementation tools and the new ways of collaborating, the alignment on the long-term challenges, the overcoming of silos, and allowing for bottom-up experimentation, as well as strategic thinking on the topic. And that was reflected a lot in, in these groups. So in the groups, uh, there were discussions around the involvement of stakeholders, including uh, more common language translating from policy, languages to uh, more inclusive language to involve more stakeholders and allow for more bottom-up uh, um, involvement. Um, there was a lot of discussion about making feedback loops about sustained mechanisms for accountability over the course of a mission, uh, uh, dealing with uncertainty, working with governance structures that already might exist and adapting those uh, so really, really interesting uh, discussions in these breakout rooms, and we'll provide a summary of those high points as uh, an output for this session. But because we have so many great panelists with us today, uh, I want to make sure that we get uh, straight to the, the juicy discussion. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have quite a lot of them today. so. Uh, uh, really, really excited to, to hear from all of them, which is why I'm keeping my intro quite short. <laughs> so joining today, uh, we have uh, Mr. Anders Brin, Strategic Area Lead of Sustainable Precision Health from Vinova, uh, Ms. Suzanne Harkinson, uh, Senior Director of Government Affairs at AstraZeneca, Henry Lee, Senior Research Fellow in Health and Innovation Policies from um, Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. Uh, Dr. Ter Teria uh, Pizzo, member of the board, uh, North Estonia Medical Center. Dr. Richard Rosenquist Brendel, uh, doctor and PhD professor of clinical genetics, Department of Molecular Medicine and Surgery, Karolinska Institute uh, and chair of genomic uh, medicine in Sweden. Dr. Ulrich Ringborg, a Senior Professor of Oncology at Karolinska Institute, and Dr. Bettina Riel, a member of the European, uh, sorry, Horizon Europe Mission Board of Can uh, for Cancer uh, Patient Network, Dr. Bern Stowasser, Head of Global Partnerships at Sanofi, Dr. Hans Haglund, uh, professor of Hematology, National Cancer Coordinator, Chair of the Confederation of Regional Cancer Centers at the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions, also co-founder and chair of Vision Zero Cancer. So as you can see, we have uh, quite the illustrious uh, panel uh, today. And uh, I'd like to start off uh, with a first kind of bit basic question, but really core question of why we need missions uh, to start with uh, in health and why specifically in cancer, kind of what, what's the opportunity, uh, frame that window of opportunity for us. And uh, for this, I, I'd ask maybe Bettina, Anders and Henry to weigh in. Um, so Bettina, the floor is yours. How would you uh, respond to this kind of opening question? So thanks for that. Um, so cancer has become the main cause of death in the western parts of Europe and the problem is going 
to increase because our societies are aging. So it is something we have to tackle. And because the, you know, the problem is inherently complex because so many parties are involved, we need a way how we can work together across multiple stakeholders in a reasonable time frame with a clear goal. And I believe that missions are a way to do that. Thanks. Fantastic. Anders? Thank you. Yes, I agree with Bettina, of course. Uh, I think missions is a very good way to provide directionality because we as individuals or as organizations, we have a limited scope of, of the societal challenges and the solutions uh, to those challenges. So, And we also have a limited mandate to operate within that scope. So as a result, we might be moving in, sl in slightly different uh, directions and we will be producing uh, suboptimal uh, products and services as a, as a consequence. So as a, as a hypothetical example, I mean, we could be producing precision cancer, cancer therapies, uh, which are too expensive for public healthcare because there are no sustainable reimbursement models in place. Or we might design new tools for molecular diagnostics, which are less accurate because current policy doesn't allow us to, to share data across borders. So the mission approach is, uh, is a way to join forces to set a common direction and, and create a, a shared understanding and commitment uh, also, it can provide a framework for uh, integrating systemic aspects of innovation, for example, technology, infrastructure, behavior, uh, policy, and so on. Indeed, no one actor is going to be able to solve it alone. Very good points. Uh, Henry, what's your, what's your opinion build on, on this? Uh, uh, thank you. To build on uh, Bettina and Anders point, I think uh, for the mission approach to work in health, actually to start with the uh, mission approach is quite implicit in health in many areas already, um, like antimicrobial resistance, like how Bettina described that her work is already mission oriented. So having that explicit focus is actually quite useful when you can identify a field where there is technological maturity there is promise for even more new science and more new cutting edge stuff. And then more importantly, there needs to be sufficient governance structures in place for health innovation and social systems, as well as the uh, complementary regulatory systems. So it, all in all, cancer seems to be one area where all these bits and pieces are already present and all it needs is a push somewhere to make things happen. So that, that's why I think the mission-oriented approach would be uh, would hold promise for cancer, but specifically we need to also identify within cancer, which is a very heterogeneous kind of um, policy area as well. We're looking at, at it from the policy angle, not, not just from the clinical angle. There are heterogeneity in pathways in the clinical manifestation. So we also need to be specific about how mission can, uh, can be applied to which part of the cancer question as well. Thank you. Excellent. Fantastic. Yes, the, the home of uh, multi-causality and uh, uncertain relationships between kind of cause and effect. Uh, of course, the health mission would be, uh, the health topic would be uh, well aligned with the mission approach. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a couple panelists, where do you see the biggest opportunity uh, in the next few years for personalized medicine? Uh, for all cancer patients. And for that, I think maybe Suzanne and, and Ulrich, if you'd like to weigh in on, on this question. Suzanne? Yes, thank you. I, I would say that the biggest opportunities lie in areas where multisectorial knowledge experience, but also decision power exist, where, where, the, where these combinations are necessary for change. I think the mission, if we can join our thoughts and our ambitions around the mission, that, that makes it easier to collaborate. But we also need co-ownership of the actions and, and the, the problems that we want to solve. And that means that we also need to, not only to collaborate, to ask somebody else to, to undertake change, but we really have to consider what can we do in our own, with our own competences and make sure that all the collaborators or co-creators take responsibility in the fields where they excel and have the biggest skills. So one example that we work with, that is a huge opportunity, I think, is within lung cancer. If we can go to, to more prevention and to earlier detection, both among risk groups and also among never smokers, there are so many lives that could be saved 
So we'd really have a joint mission there. But, but to get there, we need to collaborate not only among medical specialists or an industry like I represent myself, but also uh, behavioral societal uh, sociologists, for example, communication experts, because there are so many challenges we need to look at together and uh, collaborate uh, in solving. Excellent. And uh, Ulrich, what would you have to say? Yeah, I think the most important uh, thing with the mission is that now uh, the Commission would like to circumvent the, pre uh, the, the problem with fragmentation. The fragmentation in research, fragmentation in the healthcare, fragmentation in education. That's a main problem that has been in focus over the last 20 years. And now they would like to see a research which has, a, a, which is able to improve for risk individuals and for patients. I think that is the most important thing because we don't have the correct focus of the research processes. So, so I, I think um, the fact that they want to cover both the prevention and therapy continuum the complete continuum with all components is of extreme importance. Also that they say clearly that you need a good infrastructure background. And they start with the discussions of the comprehensive cancer centers and networks around the centers in order to reach all patients. Because inequalities is a big thing if we go to EU and of course the, world, the rest of the world. So if you look for prevention, which is not very well funded today. It has about 7% of the total cancer research budget. It's 7%. And the information you have got from research so far can reduce the cancer problem with 40%. Then we understand that the implementation research in this area is of great importance. And that is stressed very much uh, by people in the commission. And as we heard also from Susan, early detection have an, an enormous potential, not only for prevention, but also for treatment, because we need to treat patients at an earlier stage of the disease. What is also good, because this, this deals with all types of patients, independent of the histogenetic uh, diagnosis. Uh, now they want to go deeper into the biological question. Because the big problem also behind the fragmentation is the expansion of knowledge in the cancer biology. Because the cancer biology sets the agenda both for prevention research and therapeutic research. So they want to expand and have a better collaboration in order also to analyze the histogenetic groups, go into the subgroups and analyze them, all of them may differ very much and have different uh, biological background. The heterogeneity in the tumor are uh, of great importance and, uh, and the genomic instability. The stress on these uh, factors are very important in order to also have that more information about primary and acquired uh, resistance. Structuring clinical trials is a big thing also, I must say because we go to the next generation of clinical trials being more complex with more difficulties to describe the evidence-based medicine. And we have a big gap between an innovation and also implementation into the health care system. It's also good to see that the, the commission clearly say that patients should be involved in the clinical trials. They should be involved in, in, the, the, in the sharing of the comprehensive cancer centers, et cetera. But there are still important gaps with, that need to be more clearly seen. One is the health-related quality of life business. And now it is there. But what we don't see very clear is the outcomes research and the health economics in the present uh, presentation or implementation of, of the things. I'm representing the European Academy of Cancer Sciences and several of you perhaps knew that we in 2020 gave advice to the European Commission where we try to sort out all the gaps we have for, for therapeutics and for 
uh, and for uh, pre prevention and, uh, and add the necessary research. So I would say mission here with the goal to improve for risk individuals and patients, that's a big thing. Thank you so much, Suzanne and Ulrich, uh, for laying out uh, some of the, the things, um, some of the things that um, the cancer mission has going for it and uh, the support of the commission, but also some of the, the key challenge areas that we need to watch out for, uh, fragmentation and, and otherwise. Uh, I'm going to hand over next to, uh, to Ebba to uh, moderate uh, the next portion of uh, this panel. And she's going to dive in uh, with some of our panelists on what will it take to get this done. So we're going to get into the, into the details. And I would invite uh, everyone to uh, ask some questions in the chat and uh, hopefully we'll have time as well to, to get to some of those questions as well. Um, Ebba, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Angela. And thank you very much for all these important remarks made by, by several of you here in the panel. I want to co continue where, where, where Ulrich actually stopped now, how we make this to get this done, the, the, the important, the gap from translation to implementation. How do we create that value for the patient, for the health system and our societies at large? So I would like to, to ask now, uh, how do we get then the different stakeholders on board to make sure that we can commit to, to a mission, take that responsibility so that we can actually change and work towards these change needs that, that were just pointed out. So I would like to ask first to Hans, you're the national cancer coordinator, but you also started Vision Zero Cancer and I also with an initiative for working with, with clinical trials and so on to, to advance. What would you say, what does it take to, to align the different stakeholders with varying interests? Well, um, very, very important questions for sure. I, I think there are several important ingredients to get things done. As always, um, we need the right people on board with, with engagement. And I also think that collaboration, trust, bring actors together around a common vision is of, of, of importance. But also, as mentioned earlier today, include a broad mix of expertise at different levels, from the work at the office to uh, advisory boards. Uh, but maybe uh, most important to convince and to collaborate with different levels of the healthcare sector to make it, it happen. Uh, involvement includes collaboration with patient and relative, relatives in all steps is crucial, I think. And also communication, communication, communication is the key, I think, to get those things done. Thank you. Thank you. And Richard, from your perspective, you've also been instrumental in actually creating a large initiative like the Genomic Medicine Sweden Network. I'm sure you have a lot of learnings from there and also insights to share how we now can create a larger mission for personalized medicine in Sweden and, and with Europe. So I would say that um, the stakeholders are committed and they want to take responsibility. So in my view, and this is something we have discussed with Ebba, I see it as a pentahelix right now with it's probably uh, more perspectives, but it's um, academia, healthcare, patients, it is um, um, uh, authorities, and which one did I forget now? Um, Industry, I think. Industry, of course. Yes, of course. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all these, and, and we have really, uh, in our national initiatives, where we really work hands-on implementation of precision medicine in healthcare, we really want to do this together. But of course, we have to have um, um, a change in how we are working together because all of these partners are not so used always to work with each other. But I think we have a very, very fruitful discussions, at least in Sweden, between the different stakeholders that we really want to take the next step. Uh, I think we are on a good way for precision diagnostics, but we also need to, to leverage on precision medicine and uh, or precision therapies. 
uh, and also as Ulrich brought in with prevention and, and precision health, uh, the broader aspect with early detection. So, and not now we are seeing national initiatives in different countries. I think it's more than 34 uh, national or regional precision medicine initiatives in Europe. And I think we have to collaborate um, closely because uh, for instance, rare diseases or, or rare cancer diseases, you need to collaborate in a clever way to, to so patients have access both to the technologies to detect these genetic aberrations, but also to drugs and, and the combination therapy. So I think we have to do smart uh, solutions and start to, I know that many countries are trying to fix uh, for themselves uh, to organize themselves but I think soon we are ready now to start in to discuss across borders to realize common precision medicine um, concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much Richard and actually I would like to um, continue that from a, from an industry perspective and um, Bernd Stovasser from Germany from Sanofi you're also part of making public-private partnerships. Are, um, would you like to comment on what, what Richard said about um, creating uh, this uh, ways of working together to advance the, the uptake of precision medicine? Sorry, Bernd, you're on mute. Oh yeah, my, my apologies. So yes, uh, it's clear that um, uh, I fully support what uh, Hans uh, said on the principles and also Richard with clear example. So um, I have gained in the past 10 years uh, really a substantial hands-on uh, experience to build uh, large public-private partnerships. And um, instead of just repeating what was already clearly said uh, on the principle, I would like to give an example of what was uh, already done. So if you look, look at the Innovative Medicines Initiative and the coming Innovative Health Initiative, where Sweden is also a, a key player in it, and I have been, for example, many times at sites uh, at AstraZeneca and uh, Lund and at different universities. Um, so this is in total a 10 billion uh, euro endeavor where half uh, of the budget comes from the European Commission and the other half of the budget from uh, the industry in in-kind contribution. That means you have people uh, as uh, contribution and not money. That automatically uh, pushes a lot the need to collaborate. And as we talked about uh, today about uh, cancer, we have uh, about 12 major projects with a budget of almost 200 million euro uh, to catalyze uh, state-of-the-art oncology research and development. So to understand the cancer biology, personalized medicine, disease management, uh, involving patients uh, in the development of novel therapeutics. And that means really to bring more than 200 partners together from about 19 countries. Uh, about 100 from academia, 50 from industry, uh, lots, lots of small, medium enterprise and philanthropy. So um, this um, delivers clearly uh, significant output in the mid and long term. So those projects uh, take about five to seven years and uh, you can approach things which cannot be done uh, elsewhere. And to bring this all together, um, you have to do at the beginning a lot of discussion and work uh, to align people. So that includes, includes to generate a clear legal and uh, IP framework. So you need to have people on board so that not an academic, oh, okay, industry steals uh, my research or industry says, well, the academic is just want to go for the Nobel Prize and not for the objectives. Uh, of, of the project. And, and so we have to get totally rid of those uh, kinds of uh, uh, thinking. And in fact, um, and this was also said at the beginning of Hans, the trust building is really the key. Mm -hmm. And trust does not come from, uh, I would say, belief or from, uh, it, it really is hard work uh, to sit together and um, really discuss jointly and develop jointly uh, the vision. 
And so uh, in summary, what you really need is an agreement, full agreement and buying on the objectives, a clear contractual and IP framework, a clear work plan so that everything can be tracked and every player on the field knows exactly where to play. And one aspect which is hard many times overlooked, you need a professional alliance management because those things are so big that the researchers alone cannot manage it. You really need to have a professional alliance management uh, to keep, to stay fully on top of it. So that would be my uh, contribution to this question. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you so much. Would anyone like to fit into that one? A reply? Perhaps a perspective here, could I ask, it's also from, from your experience, uh, how you also bring together stakeholders around personalized medicine in, in Estonia, for instance. <laughs> Thank you, that's, that's a very good question, because in, in principle, I agree with everything that was said before, but I would like to bring here uh, perhaps to attention the fact that sometimes you're, you can have quite unusual partners that usually don't work with in the field of healthcare. For example, we did the, we drew the, the cancer patient journey and uh, tried to identify different gaps that there exist. And one of the gaps actually is as regards the access and the access not to the hospital, but access because of the lack of transport. So the partnership to solve all kinds of gaps and uh, problems, sometimes maybe in the Ministry of uh, Economy or uh, Transport, depends on the country, of course, we are all engaged in the same ministry or the local authorities who would work for it. So that uh, may sometimes bring uh, absolutely new uh, uh, types of partnership into this as well. And I think that is also where we could learn from other similar uh, uh, initiatives, such as, for example, the European uh, uh, Initiative on Active and Healthy Aging, uh, which uh, brought together uh, uh, not only healthcare and social care, but also companies who, for example, are responsible for food and uh, as well as transport, etc. So what I, I am thinking here is that in particular, when we speak about the prevention, for example, then we have to uh, cooperate with the education, with schools. We have to raise awareness and improve the health literacy level. So that is where we have to start from. So the partnership is very uh, broad. I would like to think that the list of uh, stakeholders who are not involved is shorter than those who have to be involved. Thank you. Very good point. Very good point. So I believe we, um, we, we see a lot of uh, opportunities going forward and how to broaden with the stakeholders and again, so to advance this work now when it comes to the, with the governance and the collaboration, but also to get the funding right, the regulatory aspects, uh, the health economics and so on. What we think is would be on the highest on the to do list. Um, I would actually ask Anders there to start uh, from uh, the innovation agency's perspective. Yeah, thank you, Ebba, and thanks for all the comments here in the panel. There's so much, so much to say and so much to build on here. Uh, but uh, I mean, since, since collaboration and co creation is really the key here to, to, uh, to successful mission oriented innovation, I think. Priority for us is to, to provide better conditions for building partnerships here between actors in different sectors and as Terje mentioned, out, mentioned different disciplines and also across countries, of course, and start walking the talk. I mean, we have to, to, uh, to, to do stuff and not just talk about it. So we want to support these collaborative mission driven initiatives where actors can come together and create a shared commitment. But the, uh, collaboration isn't always easy as, as Bernd uh, pointed out, it lifted challenges in, in public-private partnerships, and we have also seen uh, in policy development, for example, other challenges, for example, a regulatory agency, which could be very important to, to drive uh, policy development, could be reluctant to entering a partnership with other companies which operate in the domain that they are regulating, of course. Uh, so, uh, as, as many of you have already pointed out this morning, I mean, building trust is crucial here, and perhaps 
providing a neutral arena with a neutral leadership could overcome some of these difficulties. Um, so it's something that we, we want to try out. So at Vinova, I mean, we, we are trying to develop now how we can support mission-oriented innovation in practice. And we're um, partly then through our vision-driven health program uh, through which uh, the Vision Zero Cancer Initiative is supported. And vision-driven health is a, a new instrument uh, where we are trying to provide a framework for coordination of vision or mission-oriented innovation and to handle uncertainty uh, uh, as, as we spoke about this morning, we have adopted a more agile approach allowing for adaptability within uh, the consortium over time and for us as a public funder it's new and slightly scary actually to put money into an initiative without a clear specification of what will come out in the other end uh, but but the approach is, is very promising so far i would like to say uh, but looking at funding from a broader perspective there is a sustainability challenge here and i mean innovation funding is traditionally very project-based and solution oriented and i think funders need to work more closely together to make sure that there is a more long-term perspective on funding. I mean, we need to do more work on health economics to fully understand societal benefits of mission-oriented innovation and to develop more holistic and sustainable reimbursement models. Mm -hmm. Another funding aspect is the ability to work case-based and to build demonstrators rather than trying to change the whole system at once, which would be, of course, extremely time-consuming, cost-driving. And Vision Zero Cancer is a good example of this, starting with lung cancer, uh, where you're still trying to address all the systemic innovation aspects in a scalable way and showing that a full system transformation may be possible further on. I think I stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um... Terry, from, from Estonia, do you have any uh, comment on this also? What, what's highest on your to-do list? And, and also, I'm thinking also Sweden, so we are small countries, we have a lot in common, and you're also very advanced in the, in the personalized medicine perspective, but we're also facing the same challenge, how do you regulate and how do you also reimburse and pay? So, uh, any reflection on how we could actually work together on that? And what's high on your to-do list from your perspective and government. Indeed, the uh, to-do list is uh, usually quite long. Sometimes <laughs> things move in this to-do list up and down and usually there will be more additions than things that you can say done. And I absolutely agree with Anders that uh, it's sometimes difficult to uh, estimate what's the outcome or uh, put it in the timeline because this type of project usually are long term and you can really measure in the long perspective or you can uh, evaluate then afterwards and that is not short and usually in particular European projects are extremely short where you have a half time for preparation and then immediately you have to start summarizing and there is almost no time to carry out the project. But what we have, um, what is on, on um, for us important, what has not already been said here fully, I would say, probably mentioned in different aspects, but what I would like to highlight, first of all, as you said, that we are quite a digitized country and uh, we are really competing here with Sweden, who wants to become the digital health country 2025. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, your ministry said so. Uh, data. Data is extremely important. And here I would say that uh, it is not, it's, it's many aspects. It's the data management starting from the quality and standards and access and uh, the data protection in that sense and cybersecurity in that sense, but that should not be a limit, rather a support uh, tool for uh, making it all happen. Uh, the patient input, uh, patient uh, reported experience, patient reported outcome, patient reported incidents, all types of platforms that we could use for online monitoring, exchange of information, uh, interactive uh, uh, roles for uh, monitoring on a distance and uh, in between the visits. Uh, this uh, inclusion of different stakeholders in the same information field, for example, social care and, uh, and uh, hospital and primary care, this is a, a, that's a challenge and uh, we have to work on it. Then uh, I also think that uh, we, for example, our hospital awarded last year, we, we every year we give an uh, award for a scientific article. 
And uh, last year we awarded an article which was speaking about how to bring, bring the, all this information about genetics into the routine uh, healthcare. And if we talk about the personalized medicine, then obviously genetics plays a very important role, but it only plays important role together with all other information that is available. How to make it all as part of routine uh, work of doctors, that is a challenge because that is something new that takes time to introduce, to learn and become used to it. So the awareness raising is obviously a task here, engagement of patients as well. And third, what I would like to highlight is the prioritization. That the, if you would like to do something in one hand, for example, you do the BRCA test for uh, genetic testing for a uh, woman. But what do we do? How do you handle young woman who has this type of uh, result and it, it, she is at the higher risk? What is that you offer to her? What kind of service and who pays for it and what is happening afterwards? I think these type of steps you have to really agree uh, before you will launch this type of activity that you just create the knowledge of this type of risk, but you have no idea how to uh, mitigate the risk or how to handle these people with that risk. So I would say that the data, the awareness and uh, prioritization, uh, if you would say first three, and then the rest of the 320 comes. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I think it's it's about time to start opening up the floor. Bef while, while you all think of question, Bettina, I would also like you to add something to this point from your patient advocacy role that you also have in Europe. What would you say that you, should be most important prioritized on the to-do list to make it happen? Well, um, so we have already heard how you're supposed to involve patients and all that. I mean, the patients is at the heart of all we do in the center. And, you know, I've been hearing this now for like a decade. Um, the, the, the trick in there is actually, how do you do it? Because, I mean, this is like a previous speaker already today, uh, earlier on said, like, it's not quite so easy. You can say involve patients, but it's not done just by talking about it. It's actually quite tricky to reach a group that is representative, that gives everyone a chance, that allows them to be there at the right moment. It requires resources. I mean, it's supposed to run on good intentions, good air, I don't know what, but that's obviously not how it works. So good intentions are not enough, but how to do it will require some, some extra methodology. So uh, we've been in this space, we've been educating people for a long time. I mean, there's now an increase in research participation also of patients, but I think it's like, if we're really serious about putting um, our citizens, because patients are citizens. I mean, this is often, we often talk about citizens and patients, if patients weren't citizens, which is crazy if you really think about it. So if we think about our societies and we want our services to be really at the heart and really delivering on what matters to our people, then we have to get better at involving them. And that's why I found these discussions about these bottom-up solutions so critical, because it's how do we, these people can tell us stuff. I really like Terry's example on you know, transport. Who would have thought that transport can be something that prevents really medical intervention? You have to go looking for that. So I think that would be like, you know, we talk a lot about it, but doing is in the end where, it, uh, where we really um, change or where, where perspectives change. And that's something we've never done. We've always talked about the interest of patients, but we've never really given them a chance to do it. So that would be my thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Before we open up the others, other other reflections here from the rest of the panelists, Susan or Henry, Richard, any other further yeah, comments? Yeah, something short maybe, my yes. side. Uh, Please. Yeah, because I was thinking just building on, on what Terry and also now Bettina touched upon. I think there's one thing we haven't talked so much about, and that is also having respect for and being curious about administrative systems and leadership within healthcare that, that often, of course, activities are sort of tied into administrative routines and annual budget cycles and so on. And, and that is something we, we also need to address jointly. And that sort of spills over also into us in industry and to a lot of the, and to academia, of course, and a lot of sectors. So that's an area that has to sort of be developed hand in hand, what we try to do working towards our mission. Just wanted to make that point. Great, perfect. So several hands up here. Ulrik, I don't know if you are first or... or, or. I would like to add that already in 2007, 
we came to the conclusion after <clears throat> after a deep analysis of European Council research that collaboration between research groups is not enough. That will not make the change. You need to reach sustainability and you need to have a strong infrastructure background. And the infrastructure background is increasing over time when you move into personal or precision cancer medicine. So therefore you need collaboration between centers. But centers should be is integrated centers with research, education, and healthcare. That means the comprehensive cancer center. Already on that time point, this was a clear, uh, a, a clear advice to the commission to continue. And we are on that way. So if we want a sustainable situation, we need not invent this again, because this is tested now in Germany, and it has worked very, very well with the consortium of center for long-term collaboration in translational research. And translational research all the time has the focus on patients' needs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eldrick. Henry, over to you, to London. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, second um, Susanna's point on the importance of implementation science. And I think, um, Drawing from my experience learning and studying um, the implementation of a mission-oriented program in China on antimicrobial resistance, I feel that there's generally a big disconnect between um, health policy, especially with uh, the implementation science, kind of like not just literature, but just the whole kind of like insight and practice of it. And mm -hmm. as I was deepening my studies, I realized my original goal was to understand how doctors prescribe medicines, antibiotics in China, and what influenced their decisions to prescribe. And it evolved into a study of how China is governed, the whole public administration structure, how policy happened there, how they are translated, what are the translation mechanisms, how the authorities work together with one another. And, and surprisingly enough, a lot of understanding about bottom-up um, implementation and also bottom-up structures, structures that allow for those meaningful local engagements. And I think in COVID, one of the uh, striking examples is uh, the residential committees in China, which are uh, responsible for nudging um, and uh, encouraging residents to take COVID tests, making sure that they're staying at home, giving them food so that they actually have incentive to, um, to, to, to shield, things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel that uh, my, my my time, three years so far in, in trying to soak up this um, uh, great mission idea is it, also reflective of, of that. Like that, there, there needs to be conversations and understanding of how implementation works in a public administration context. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, over to you. I would like to highlight the point of transparency in many ways, the transparency within this mission so that everybody knows what the other part is doing, not that the collaboration is like two-sided, that I know what you are doing, but the third and fourth party don't know what we are doing. So to avoid the repetition, I think that from the financial point of view, just to uh, use the resource uh, effectively would make sense that we really don't waste and uh, not only within the, this cancer mission, but also within the uh, thinking about a bit broader healthcare in general, because there are good things learned through this mission that could be very valuable lessons learned for other areas in healthcare. Let's say if we take this transport question, maybe the same would be very useful knowledge for other patients with chronic diseases or, or uh, other uh, people with the same uh, challenges as regards the uh, IMI project lessons learned or the cooperation with the uh, primary care and uh, between the tertiary level hospitals. I think that is uh, knowledge that is worth of sharing more broadly than within the mission. I agree. Point taken. So over to you, Angela. Perhaps some, some more reflections from you. And also, do we have questions uh, from the audience? Or the participants, rather, I would like to say. We're all participants here together. Yes. Well, I'd like to build on uh, something that uh, Bernd mentioned about building oh. trust and some examples, some really concrete examples like the IP framework, the kind of systems mapping, the alliance management. 
Uh, I'm wondering if any of our uh, panelists have any other examples of what they've found effective in building trust in these, uh, these alliances. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I have given an example, uh, maybe an even more concrete one. So uh, one of the initiatives we started at the very beginning was on diabetes. And um, um, we found out at the very beginning that, of course, academics are very uh, used to work with industry, with different players. But what we found out at the beginning was that industry, in fact, was not used to collaborate um, among each other. So um, you discover at the very beginning things you would never thought about. And you say about industry, but it's different companies. And so they have to share knowledge. And this was really a big learning to trust each other because we put knowledge on the table, which is always borderline to product development, to competition and so on. And we found out at the end that the payoff uh, to do this is much higher than the risk um, you take. But this was a really long experience. And then, uh, you, you, and then once you are aligned, you talk to the academics. A very concrete example, uh, Professor Bernard Torrent from the University of Lausanne, a very strong, super uh, researcher uh, on diabetes. At the beginning, he was very critical. He said, well, we, when we work with industry, how, how can we make sure we have uh, all the IP settled? And, and then suddenly we had lots of lawyers of different institutions and companies in one room who had to, uh, to work out a framework. And you have to go through all this. Um, if you shy away, uh, it's done. But in the process of generating all the rules and sitting on one table, at the end, it was like when I go to University of Lausanne, I sit on Bernard Toro's desk. He gives to me to, to do some of the work. And this is a result of maybe three to five years uh, of collaboration. Once you have this established, you can build off it for the rest of your life. But it's hard work. It doesn't come for free. And it needs really uh, a strong engagement to overcome uh, personalities, uh, to overcome your own ego and uh, your own status and so on. You need to work as a team. Really important point. Doesn't happen. Uh, these kind of relationships aren't built um, overnight or because uh, someone gave uh, one speech. So this is really a really important point, uh, Bernd. Thank you. Uh, Ulrich, uh, you want to weigh in and then Bettina after that. Yeah, very short. Andrew. We had the same type of problems in the council area. And 10 years ago, we had a lot of discussions with FIA and, and industry about it. Because you need, to, you need to go for combinations or targeted drives in order to, <coughs> to, in order to target pathways. And it was extremely difficult to have here collaboration between industries. And that has been a, a, a problem, and is still a problem, how to circumvent this. The industry has to go into collaborations for. Thank you. Uh, oh, Okay, I think, uh, sorry. Okay, you're good. That was my turn. Okay. So I just like, I like to be a little bit the glass uh, half full person here because I mean, we always talk about problems, but let's just look back at the last two years. I think we in Europe have proven to ourselves that we're totally able to get our act together and develop a new therapy in a very short amount of time. And well, let's say the scale up was not without issues, but we even got it to a large part of our population. So anyone who comes to me and says, we can't do this in cancer, I'm sorry, we've just, we had a demonstrator, we've heard today how important demonstrators is. We've uh, built one, a European-wide demonstrator. So it's not that it's so tricky. There's something about a sense of urgency and there's something, a willingness. And of course, we also only did one thing and we let everything slip. So it's not a fair comparison and I totally get that. But I think we should maybe be a little bit proud of what we have achieved. And to quote Ben, back to himself, actually, I think the... I don't think that everyone has realized that it takes expertise and people who are professional in management at, at managing multiple stakeholders. It takes a dedicated person expertise inside the ability to work in that setting. And I'm not sure lots, that everyone is aware of that. So we still think single 
experts can solve it and I don't think we can so that's why I think this is so exciting that the that the Swedish Cancer Virgin is, is actually located at Vinova which is the innovation agency so it's not a research agency it's an innovation agency and I think it benefits from this broad perspective and I think that is something for us to where the the, the point is where I think we can switch. Thank you. Uh, Anders it looks like you have your hand up and then I'm wondering if uh, Hans and Richard you'd like to contribute after that since we haven't heard from you in, in a while and we're getting close to the end here um, but uh, over to you Anders and then uh, I'll, just I'll open up. Just, just a very quick, uh, Bettina almost said what I was going to say, that it takes strong strong, strong leadership in, in, a, in a good sense. Uh, and uh, I would like to quote Hans as well, communication is so important. And what Terje said about transparency, all of these th three, uh, three pillars really of, of management is crucial to make collaboration work in, in these kind of, kinds of consortium. Thank you. Thank you. And Hans, so Richard, do you have a glass half full reflection uh, to... <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can only, um, I, was think, I was thinking about what Bettina said. I think we have to actually try to learn a lot from, from, from the COVID pandemic and all those experience from, from that. And, and um, I will also say that uh, Europe now is, is more uh, willing or, or to work with, with health uh, and, and uh, actually um, focus on cancer. So I think now is the, the time to, mm -hmm. to do this. And also I think that the, the vision is of importance. I didn't mention that, but uh, uh, vision zero cancer, I think we can all agree and, and sign on that. And, and that will be of importance, I think, for the future. Okay, so my glass is more than half full. I think we have a fantastic position right now because what we are saying is that all of us, the different stakeholders want to go in the same direction. And I think there are also very strong examples. I see that Margareta put in the chat that we are now working closely together with patient organizations really to, to make them involved and educate and also with industry, I mean, I think that will be uh, equally important to, to have this close collaboration because we cannot do it alone with an academia and healthcare. So we, we need all partners to be on board. So I'm quite positive. I think we will go there. And I think what Ulrich pointed out with the comprehensive cancer centers, for instance, in Germany, shows the power when you go together and can plan larger studies in, in, in cancer. So let's join forces and continue to strive for, for um, this uh, with personalized or precision medicine in cancer. Excellent. Something that I heard in the discussion too is even though there seems to be some healthy competition even between countries of uh, Sweden and Estonia, who is going to be the leader in, uh, uh, in, in these topics. So that to me is, uh, is a good sign. And, and if there's healthy competition on that topic, everybody wins. Um, so that's my glass uh, half full reflection. Um, we're getting close to the end of time. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, Eba and Victoria, you wanna come in with some kind of closing remarks uh, on this topic and tie it all into the work of uh, Vision Zero Cancer. Well, thank you so much. Um, um, and um, I think uh, from, from my perspective, we have a lot to bring with us into our workshops tomorrow when we are continue to develop and setting our mission. And I just want to say again also that what is exciting when, when we work now with Vision Zero Cancer and our newly then shaped test bed Sweden for precision health in cancer is also that that this brings a lot of learning and excitement uh, to, to it. And it's, it's it, just to add that we are grateful for this uh, support uh, to actually, to, with, with Vinova to actually set a framework where active leadership, um, how, we, how we build trust and sharing, some of the mechanisms are in, in place. So we have a framework around it in this calls for vision driven health and precision health that makes it a bit easier. To, to navigate in this landscape and making sure that we have all types of stakeholders across the system on board and more to add on, of course. So it's a joint learning process there, which is very exciting. 
and I look very much forward to, to, to work tomorrow. And as we just said, that the pandemic has tested the healthcare systems around the world, but also created a unique opportunity to redefine cancer care. We know we're not going back to, to the past, we're going to a new normal. And I think it's a great opportunity to set that new normal together. So from my side, I would like to thank you all very much for today's exciting work. I've learned so much. I have so much into the next business or roadmap rather than a project plan that we're going to present to Vinova in a few weeks. Uh, Victoria, over to you, my colleague, innovation leader at Vision Zero Cancer. Everyone, I would just like to say my deepest gratitude for this day. I have learned so much. And if there is anything I really take away from this is that Sometimes it can be a bit lonely driving this sort of innovation boat where we're at, at our different sort of silos right now. But I just feel that we have so much to take away from each other and the wheel does definitely not need to be reinvented. We are just aligning ourselves and it takes so much courage, courage and trust and transparency what we're doing right now. So I am so thrilled about that and I look forward to engaging more interactively tomorrow.